Hi, and welcome to the next webinar in our new Planty Presents Global Plant Science Talk Series. My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few things just to make sure you get the most out of attending today's webinar. If you're experiencing technical issues, please let us know about those using the chat box or by emailing me at krogers at ASPB.org. If you're having trouble connecting or need to leave the webinar early, know that a recording of this webinar will be made available along with all of the associated materials within a few days. If you have questions during today's webinar, please let us know using the GoToWebinar chat box. Today's talks will each be 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes for questions. Jürgen Kleinven, who is an associate professor at the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, is with us today to moderate questions and read them aloud to our panelists. Maddie Seal is also here to help co-moderate and select the questions that will be read aloud. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plantain, the open online community for plant scientists, powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code PRESENTS10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. This webinar is the fifth in our new virtual research talk series that we created in response to the closure of most universities due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Please visit our webpage for more information on this series and to sign up if you'd like to be considered as a speaker. You can find us on social media at plantae underscore org and at ASPB. For those of you listening to this as a recording, feel free to reach out on Twitter with follow-up questions or comments using hashtag plantae presents. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm now gonna turn it over to Jurgen to introduce our speakers and moderate today's session. Thank you, Katie. I also warmly welcome everyone uh, watching this right now and also everyone that will watch the recording uh, at some point. Um, today we, we host Nico Geltner and uh, Sarah Blizzard, uh, which also reflects our aim to, um, to provide here a forum for both experience and early career researchers. And we will soon have also early career folks moderating the seminar. That's why uh, Maddie Seal is also uh, with us today and, and she's going to moderate uh, the talks in, in two weeks as well. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in, in contributing to the seminar series, please just reach out to us and, and contact us. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Sarah Blizzard. Um, she is an early career scientist. She volunteered or halfway was volunteered by her PI, Erin um, Sparks, to give this lecture here. Um, Sarah graduated from Grove City College and uh, she worked for a couple of years as a lab technician. And then uh, she joined Erin as a master's student at the University of Delaware. Um, and uh, she's now uh, doing her research on a novel organ formation in, in crop roots. And she will talk about investigating the role of hormones in maize brace root development. I'm Sarah Blizzard. I'm a master's student in Erin Sparks lab at the University of Delaware and really happy to be talking to everyone today. So. Here we go, I'm gonna talk about the role of hormones in maize brace root development. Um, some of you might be familiar with aerial adventitious roots. They're found in many plant species, such as the um, ficus tree. They have these beautiful long roots reaching down from their branches all the way to the ground. If you're like me, you might have an orchid uh, in your home or office and they have these beautiful um, aerial roots. These types of roots are not only found in exotic species like this, they're also found in important agricultural crops such as maize. And that will be the focus of my talk. So the maize root system is a typical monocot root system composed of embryonic roots, including the primary root seen here in red, as well as seminal roots in this um, dark blue as well as post-embryonic roots, including crown roots in gold. These roots form from the stem below ground and brace roots seen here in brown. They form from the stem above ground. And from all of these root types, um, lateral roots can form. The dominant roots after um, 
V6 are the crown and brace roots, and V6 uh, refers to vegetative stage six. This simply means that there are six fully emerged leaves, and this is how we um, stage our plants. So first I'd like to uh, define some terms because uh, the terminology can be a little confusing. So adventitious roots are any roots that form from non-root tissue. These can form through wounding or they can be induced by stress. However, they can also form as part of endogenous development. A subclass of these are called stem-borne roots and um, they can form in both eudicots and monocots. In monocots, they're often called nodal roots, and nodal roots are further divided into crown and brace roots, as I already mentioned. Brace roots themselves can be both aerial and aerial and subterranean, meaning they'll grow into the ground. So the Sparks Lab, um, we're interested in the function, development, and environmental regulation of brace roots. My specific project aims to define the mechanisms of brace root development. So um, post-embryonic root development is often thought of in terms of lateral roots. Here we have a rice root and um, a primordia is forming from the pericycle. The pericycle is this uh, layer of cells seen in red here. Um, and often these same principles are applied to adventitious root development. However, um, these roots that I'm talking about form from stem tissue, and stem tissue is very different from root tissue. Stem tissue consists of the epidermis and hypodermis are on the periphery, and then there's this sea of ground tissue interspersed by these uh, vascular bundles. So the question remains, how are brace roots forming from stem tissue? Here is an example. A uh, brace root pseudo colored with its um, cell fates. In pink, there's the pith. Uh, here's the provascular tissue, flanking tissue, and in yellow, here's the root cap. I should mention these are um, hand sections stained with calcifor white for cellulose. And so the broader picture of my project is to determine the morphological and molecular signatures of brace root initiation. There are three stages of post-embryonic root development. In the first stage, induction, um, cells are de-differentiated and defined as a founder cell. And here we cannot detect any morphological changes. In the next step, cells will divide and define their tissue layers. And here we can identify primordia as seen by this uh, little drawing here. And in the third stage, the primordia will expand and emerge through the stem. I'm mostly interested in the initiation phase. Uh, most recent work done on brace root initiation is back uh, in the 80s from Margaret McCulley and her lab. And uh, she found that brace roots likely initiate from cortex cells adjacent to the nodal plexus. And I'll come back in a minute and uh, tell you what the nodal plexus is. But here she uh, did some staining, again, with calcifor white for cellulose. And we see there's reduced staining uh, where the primordia is forming, indicating the breakdown of cell wall components where this new organ um, is going to emerge. And so coming back to the nodal plexus, um, the stem anatomy is very different at the node versus the internode. And so the node is this kind of bulge here where the brace roots are forming. And the internode is simply the segment of stem in between each node. Here is a hand section of the internode stained for lignin. And we see those scattered vascular bundles. Here is the node, um, the bottom of the node, I should say. And here's this um, nodal plexus as pointed out by these red arrows. These are horizontal vascular strands. We don't know a whole lot about them, but we do know when they form this kind of ring around the periphery at the top of the node. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is where we see primordia forming as pointed out by these white arrows. And here's just a closer look at a younger tissue section um, with the cell fates also pointed out here. And so this uh, serves as a anatomical landmark for us when we're sectioning and looking for primordia. 
And so one of the first steps was to define the morphological timing of race root initiation. And this work was started by a previous grad student, Nate Harlan. And so sectioning and imaging across various stages and looking at the first three above ground nodes of a plant. And so node one is the node closest to the ground. And so the most mature in terms of developmental time and node three will be the youngest. And again, these red arrows are pointing out the primordia. And so what we found was at the V6 stage, um, this fully captures all three stages of development here, where at node one, the primor primordia are beginning to emerge from the stem. In node two, um, they're in the initiation phase. And in node three, they're in the induction phase. We don't normally see a whole lot of primordia forming just yet, um, but we know they're about to come. And so we wanted to define the molecular regulation of race root initiation. And so we did this through RNA sequencing. First, I um, hand sectioned the first three above ground nodes of a V6 plant. I should mention all of this work is in a V73 in red line. And um, I first looked for um, either the presence of primordia, pointed out by these red arrows, or the nodal plexus in the shape of a ring. And pointed out by these blue arrows. Um, and so this, uh, these sections were flash frozen and sent to amaryllis nucleics for three prime end RNA sequencing. And based on this MDS plot, we see that the data clusters by node, indicating that there is a distinct transcriptional signature for each node. And so if we compare this data, um, the comparison between node two and node one are candidates for the emergence signal. As we see here, the um, primordia are beginning to emerge from the stem, and here they're still within the stem. So here we have roughly 1,200 genes. And again, comparing node three to node two, these are candidates for initiation. And um, because here we have primordia within, within the stem, and here we don't normally see a whole lot of primordia forming just yet. And here we have almost 3,000 genes. And so um, work started by this previous grad student um, was looking at doing a mutant analysis of these genes. However, this sort of unbiased approach did not yield any remarkable results. And so I decided to take a targeted approach looking at phytohormones just within my initiation candidates here. And this is because there are a couple mutants here that have been cloned all um, affected in shoehorn root development, and they are all auxin related. And this leads me to my hypothesis that auxin is necessary and sufficient to initiate brace roots. However, if we look, um, we have uh, genes in all of these hormone related pathways. There are a bit more in the auxin category, so I've focused my attention there. We don't see any, <clears throat> excuse me, auxin related genes um, involved in biosynthesis, which makes sense. As we know, auxin is usually produced in meristems. Um, genes related to auxin transport, we have two efflux genes, meaning they are transporting auxin out of a cell, and three influx genes, they're transporting auxin into a cell. And the blue again corresponds with here, these are upregulated and orange, they're downregulated. Auxin signaling genes, we have three activators and seven repressors. The majority of these activators were upregulated, and here, majority were downregulated. And finally, we have two early auxin response genes. And so overall, these, um, it kind of paints a rather confusing picture. Um, we aren't quite sure what auxin is doing here. And so, um, what we'd expect is the auxin forming a maxima as it does in other forms of organ initiation. Um, and we can visualize this using the DR5 reporter line. DR5 will show you um, where auxin is transcriptionally active. And here at the root tip, we know auxin forms a maxima. I have started working uh, looking at these um, reporter lines, however, we ran into issues because um, my tissue is mature and has secondary cell walls and there's a lot of autofluorescence. And so 
It's very different than looking at these young um, Arabidopsis seedlings. However, I have started to look at the PIN1 reporter line, and PIN1 is an auxin efflux protein. It is transporting auxin down the root where it forms this maxima at the quiescent center. And it, it has this sort of inverted fountain model where it flows back up and down. So here I've actually had to switch from hand sectioning to cryosection, cryosectioning in order to um, have better imaging results. And with the help of Jeff Kaplan and the UD Bioimaging Corps, um, here is a section of um, a V6 plant cryosection. And the yellow is the PIN1 um, signal, and all of the blue is autofluorescence. And if we look closer, this um, circles a uh, primordia here. And so we see PIN1 expression around the outer edge of the root cap here, which makes sense because we know auxin is involved in breaking down the cell wall when a new organ is emerging. We also see it within the provascular here, which is really intriguing. However, we're expecting to see a maxima where the quiescent center is forming. Um, what's really intriguing is that around the very edge of the section here, there is this um, pin one expression. And so here, uh, this is the edge of the tissue between the leaf and the stem, the epidermis. We know there's roughly five to seven layers of hypodermis. So this uh, pin one expression appears to also be cortex cells. Um, as Margaret McCulley found back in the 80s. Um, however, we don't know if this is some sort of sub-identity of um, cortex cells. Maybe it functions as a cambium layer as it would in dicots producing secondary growth. We just don't know. We do know that primordia are going to form here eventually because in a um, mature plant, the race roots kind of surround the whole outer edge here. So a lot of questions remain here. What cell or tissue type is PIN1 localized to? And how does PIN1 expression change over the course of development? It would be really interesting to do some single cell RNA sequencing and compare cells um, with the PIN1 expression, cortex cells, and hypoderm hypodermis cells, and see how those uh, expression profiles um, compare. Now, these questions have been related to, um, is auxin necessary for brace root initiation? I was also interested in asking, is auxin sufficient for brace root initiation? And I'm doing that by exogenously applying hormones to the maize stem. I've worked out this protocol where I have um, a needle pushing a thread through, uh, attached to these tubes, our food dye and my hormone solution. And so um, the solution will travel up the thread by capillary action. And I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. You might ask, why not just add your hormone to the water as you water your plant? Um, the thought here is I'm interested in local effects. And we know auxin has effects all over the plant. Um, other approaches have been to add a lanolin plug to the outer edge here with your hormone. Um, the problem is ma uh, maize has this uh, waxy cuticle and a very tough outer sheath that's difficult to penetrate. Um, Mandy Rasmussen at the University of Nottingham is working on a scuffing approach to achieve that end. So um, this is my approach. My first step was simply to add some food dye and water and see how far it travels. So here's the application site. IN indicates internode and N indicates node. So we see it travels roughly two nodes up and two nodes down, although it seems to travel more up than down. However, if we look at these sections at the application site, we see they're a little bit mangled and uh, kind of destroyed. So um, I've changed my approach a tiny bit and now I'm applying just below node three. I left it on for 10 days. I, I'm using um, a synthetic auxin, an auxin inhibitor, water and food dye control, and a control with no application. So here's that control. All I've done is removed the outer leaves so I can see the node and whether primordia are forming. What's really interesting is uh, in my water control, I actually produce tillers. 
And so we think this is due to wounding. We know that can sometimes produce tillers. I also started to produce one in my auxin replicate. And in my inhibitor, I didn't produce uh, tillers. However, all of these um, had brace root primordia forming at these nodes. And so this was the result of one experiment and then we were interrupted by the shutdown. So plans to continue with adding a wounding control are um, currently just plans right now. So um, in conclusion, I have a, a lot of future directions to take. This Our project's kind of opened up a whole lot more questions than it's actually answered. And so my hypothesis that auxin is necessary and sufficient to initiate brace roots Kind of remains a hypothesis at this point and uh, in the future I'd like to take um, my candidate genes from RNA sequencing to do a mutant analysis. It would also be interesting to do in situ hybridization in order to see where those transcripts localize and if they're um, in the same areas where brace root primordia are initiating. I'd also look, like to look at PIN1 expression and determine the cellular origin of um, brace root primordia. So with that, I'd like to thank the members of my lab, my awesome PI, Aaron, uh, members of my thesis committee, Jeff Kaplan, Harsh Bass, um, Tim Chaya, part of the Bioimaging Corps, and Mandy Rasmussen. So thanks, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Sarah. And as, as always, so I will um, take some questions from the audience, but if you, uh, watch this as a recording. So once again, so we we are happy to to uh, direct this uh, discussion on to Twitter as well. So use the hashtag uh, Plante Presents, and uh, use also maybe the Twitter handle of Sarah, um, which is Sarah B Bliss. And yeah, so one one of the question um, from Mafatlal Care uh, relates to the um, auxin that you use. So, so was there a particular reason why you used the synthetic auxin NAA and not the um, endogenously occurring IA? Um, I had previously started with um, 2,4-D, another type of auxin, and um, based on conversations with other people, we um, changed to NAA as um, maybe being more effective in maize. That was the reason, but definitely we're interested in trying different types of auxin to see how that works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, Godwin, Godwin James um, is is wondering about the, the whether the wounding response um, could, in general, um, have an effect on the primordial formation. Definitely, that's why we're um, we'd be interested to adding a control where we simply put the needle through and don't add any hormone and see if wounding has an effect on the brace redevelopment. So um, yeah, a lot of ideas here that we could try. We're just currently shut down, so. Mm -hmm. um, and then maybe a question on the, 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 the pin one um, line that you use. So this was the, the maze pin one, I guess, right? So, uh, so one yes. thing is that, that how, how how does it relate to the the pins in Arabidopsis? So is is it actually the the closest homologue of pin one in Arabidopsis, or is, is the the naming different in maize? I believe there are more pin genes in maize, but I can um, double check and um, if you contact me afterwards, I can confirm that. Mm -hmm. But um, I know there are homologs. I just um, don't have off the top of my head which ones they are. But this was pin one. I know there's some, um, you know, there's pin two, pin three, four, five, so a lot more mm -hmm. pin genes out there. Okay. And uh, Putri Prasetyanigrum, I probably completely mispronounced his name, um, is wondering whether there's the pin one mutant available and whether this one uh, fails to, to make brace roots. I don't believe there's a pin one mutant available, but um, if there is, that's something we'd definitely be interested in. <coughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, All of the mutants that we have uh, were listed in that table, I think. So it's difficult to get mutants of root um, traits because there's a lot of um, uh, redundancy in root development. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's I kind guess. of difficult to get them. 
Um, so I, I'm combining here two questions. Um, one from uh, Lakshmi Sate uh, is wondering what kind of dye you really use. And, and the other one from Jean Greenberg uh, is wondering whether auxin would move in a similar way, like, oh, if you expect that it moves in a similar way, like the dye. Yeah, so um, one thing I wanted to look into definitely is if auxin, if it's roughly the same size as the food dye, I simply used a food dye bought from like a grocery store, like just a food dye. And so um, if they're roughly the same size, we think they'd probably travel the same distance. But um, yeah, that's something we'd want to look into for sure. And uh, um, we know that um, oxen can definitely travel throughout the plant. And so we assume at least as far as the food dye has traveled, the oxen can probably travel there too. Mm -hmm. Does that answer the question? Maybe. Maybe, yes. So probably there's also a direction, I mean, possibly a different directionality for the oxen transport, but mm -hmm. that's yeah. um, a bit difficult to assess by, by just adding it. Um, Magdalena Yulkowska um, is, is wondering whether some of the candidates that, that you got or that, that one can possibly get from the, I guess, from the RNA-seq approach, whether one could look into Arabidopsis to, to validate some of them. I guess in, in adventitious routing or something like this? Yeah, so that's definitely a possibility. Um, the difficulty is maize is just so different than Arabidopsis. Um, but yeah, that's definitely one approach, comparing things to Arabidopsis and seeing what we can, what information we can glean from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Joseph Dubrovsky is wondering whether the brace roots always uh, form close to the external vascular bundle. Um, yes, that's something we usually see is adventitious roots will develop um, in proximity to vasculature. We don't know why, we don't know a whole lot more than that, but yes, they, <clears throat> that is like a consistent thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a couple of questions um, that, that wonder about other hormones. So did you, because I mean, you, you directly jumped to, to auxin probably mm -hmm. due to its known role in, in de novo organogenesis, but did you look into whether other uh, hormones may also play a role here? Definitely other hormones are probably going to be involved. I know there's been some work with um, ethylene, um, and so we could definitely dive into the data about those genes as well. Oxen was just seemed, um, based on other studies as well, that oxen was, um, involved that's why we chose to go down that pathway but definitely we know there's interplay between um, all of the hormones in terms of de development so yeah mm -hmm. uh, Job Vermeer is wondering whether you see signs of programmed cell death in brace root formation um we haven't we haven't looked into that but um definitely when the brace roots are emerging from the stem we need um, the outer cells there to um, die to make way for them to emerge. So um, that's not something we're currently working on, but we know that it that has to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so some people also wonder about the uh, the oxygen concentration that you applied. Yes. Yeah, so this was a ten micromolar concentration of auxin. Um, I definitely had plans to try different concentrations as well um, and a whole range of them. So definitely the concentration could be affecting my results as well. So again, this was one experiment and then um, shut down. So I can't continue as of yet, but definitely we had plans in place to try different concentrations, different types of auxin and compare them. Mm -hmm. So when you were showing these, these application experiments, it also looked at the, that the wisps change. So did, did you get fatter stems by, by, the, by the application? That's something I didn't look into is measuring the width of the stems. And that would be interesting to see because I would definitely just need a lot more replicates to confirm because there is just variability in, in my plants and how wide their stems are. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we did see, um, they were kind of bending a little, and I definitely think the wounding was a factor where it definitely weakened the stem. 
And so we had that kind of weird twist happening. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely the approach is a little bit rough on the plants. We know that it's mm -hmm. uh, a little painful to them probably. Uh, Jochen Long is uh, is wondering about these uh, horizontal vasculatures at the nodes, and um, and do you know how they are connected uh, to the to the vertical vasculature? Yes, there's been um, there's some papers out from probably the 90s and early 2000s that um, traced how they were connected at the nodes all the way through the internodes, and so I can definitely. Um, put him in contact with those papers if he's interested. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe last question from um, Jimmy John um, is wondering if the, the brace roots only emerge in in soil. So maybe that the question relates like um, how, does it need light or if, if you would cover it with soil. So do you also get them brace roots uh, coming out from from the nodes? Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. This kind of relates to um, environmental regulation. So uh, other members of my lab are looking into shading, they're looking into gravity responses. And so there's just a whole wide field of things we don't know about these root types. And so um, it's definitely very important to ask these questions and figure out um, how brace roots will respond to these different conditions so that farmers can have a better idea of you know how to grow their crops and if we can improve their root systems definitely increase yield and um yeah good questions mm -hmm. great thank you sarah for thank the you. very nice presentation and also for the for the good very good discussion um and there are more questions so um you will get a, a list of these questions also um after the talk by katie uh, and maybe some people will still contact you via twitter and and, and keep on discussing with you well, yes, and um, now let's let's get to to Nico Gelder first. So you don't see him right now uh, because he has issues with uh, with his uh, webcam. But Nico, uh, once uh, upon a time, was was also an early career uh, scientist, and and I can tell you firsthand because I studied in Tübingen, uh, where I met him um, uh, while he was a PhD candidate with with Gerd Jürgens, and already back then, uh, Nico kind of uh, was already the Jürgen Klopp of uh, of plant science, and uh, and he was already very special. Um, even as a PhD student, he was already some sort of a subgroup leader in in Gerd's uh, department. Um, and after his enormous enormously successful PhD, um, he joined John Corey at the Sorg Institute as a postdoc, where he studied by one uh, receptor trafficking, and uh, also learned how to surf. Um, and Maybe a sidetrack here again for some early career researchers. So when, when Nico was looking for his first independent position, um, his uh, postdoc paper was still hanging. Uh, so he had the same issue like, like many uh, have. So, you know, you're on the job market and then your paper is not yet out. And uh, so the lesson here is that even for someone like Nico, some of our um, maybe stupid unwritten rules uh, make it harder to succeed uh, in, in science. And I think there are quite some um, uh, um, institutes out there that that um, are now unhappy that, that they turned Nico down uh, at that time. Anyway, so Nico landed eventually in 2007 in Lausanne, which lifted him up um, to, to do his independent and truly outstanding work on endodermis and its Kasparian strip. Um, by now, Nico is, is full professor there in Lausanne, and um, the, the work coming out of his lab is, is really enormously impressive. Um, and the most impressive thing about his work is that it usually goes straight into the student textbooks. Um, and in a nutshell, he, he just shows us how important it is to, to have a, a very defined spatial and temporal resolution on, on plant development. And today he will speak about uh, Schengen, uh, pathway signaling, developmental quality control in, in plants. So hello, everybody. Um, I'm very sorry that you can't uh, see me. I can't convince my computer to allow access to um, the camera. So, um, but I think as long as you have the slides, everything should be fine. So I, today I want to tell you about something that you might have heard from me about uh, before, about the Schengen pathway. And, uh, but today I want to make a, a talk that is maybe a bit lighter and a bit more conceptual than I, than I usually do. 
and uh, really try to convince you that that uh, what this Schengen pathway is uh, all about is that it's uh, developmental quality control in plants that that helps uh, plants to actually make uh, rather perfect uh, tissue layers. So there has been a lot of uh, recent uh, and uh, very nice collaborative progress actually uh, in in on, on the Schengen pathway. And there were just three papers coming out actually um, in, in 2020. And so uh, the one here is, is, uh, was led by, by my group. Um, and this was um, Satoshi Fujita, who was the lead author. And it is this paper that, that really um, was tying together, the, I mean, this Schengen pathway into a pathway. I'm always talking about a pathway, but really we can only claim that uh, we have established that it's a, it's a, it's a real pathway because of the work of Satoshi. Uh, and uh, this work is also establishing uh, how very important the subsidiary localization of the components um, are in the functioning of this pathway. Uh, and then a very important uh, collaboration that was um, uh, from the lab of, of Michael Hothorn and led by uh, Satohiro Okuda um, was actually um, presenting the, the crystal structure uh, of uh, Schengen 3 and uh, importantly established that there is not only two peptides that we initially thought but that there are more peptides i'm going to talk about this uh, in a moment that that have um, very probably uh, different functions in different tissues uh, and then this um, report in science uh, from the group of uh, Gwyneth ingram uh, led by by nicolas doll um, really is is a, is a is a wonderful story that establishes that this this Schengen pathway is used in in very interesting in a very interesting variant in a very interesting twist uh, in the um, in a in a communication between the endosperm and the embryo um, to establish uh, an embryonic cuticle. So uh, here is now just uh, the result from from uh, Michael Hotton's group from Satohiro Okuda, uh, where you can see actually um, the receptor uh, of the Schengen pathway, which is we call Schengen 3. It's also called Gasho uh, 1 by the group of Gwyneth Ingram. And it is an LRR receptor-like uh, kinase. And you can here see that it's actually a very long um, LRR. It, it consists of, I think, 33 repeats. And it's making one and 1 1.5 uh, turns, actually, of this corkscrew that, that um, that plant LRRs uh, are doing, and so it's 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 actually the longest LRR that is uh, existing in plants. I'm I'm weirdly proud of that, um, to the embarrassment of Michael. And uh, but it is very interesting to point that out that LRRs generally and and Schengen three in particular are are structures that that are that that are quite long, quite quite big. And uh, here you can see that this 50 nanometers. Um, uh, in length, so that is two to three times actually the plasma membrane, and I find it absolutely fascinating to to try and and understand, and I really don't understand uh, how these receptors uh, are interacting with the cell wall matrix. Uh, you, they really should have um, very very restricted lateral diffusion uh, and should uh, really stick into um, the the cell wall matrix. So you can see here that uh, apart from that, it's a, it's a classical LRR. Uh, that uh, is binding to these uh, peptides. Uh, and these peptides, they are called uh, SIFs, Casparian Strip Integrity Factor, and they are a novel class of um, sulfated, uh, sulfated peptides. Okay? Here's just a, a comparison um, to another um, uh, receptor that is the root growth um, vector receptor that is um, binding to another type of sulfated peptides. The peptide is a bit shorter, and the receptor is also a bit shorter. Now, the important finding from, um, uh, from uh, uh, Satohiro's paper was that, uh, that they found that actually uh, there, are, there, are four, there are five uh, different Casparian strip integrity factors, so defined as being able to bind the receptor and having an in vivo activity uh, like the initially discovered CIF1 and CIF2 uh, in endodermal differentiation. And so we named them now CIF 1, 2, 3, and 4. And now if you count, then you say, OK, we're at the fifth. And the fifth we don't call um, CIF 5 because it had already a name. Uh, and that is uh, called twisted seed. And that, that is of the, the CIFs. And it is this one that is involved 
uh, and very important in embryonic cuticle formation. And the important thing is just to, 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 to note that it is clear that there is a bunch of um, sulfate peptide ligands. And it's not a, uh, it's not a, a subclass of RGFs or so. It's, it's really an entirely different class of sulfate peptide ligands. So they are essentially now, uh, as far as I could count, uh, four classes of uh, sulfate peptide ligands. There's Psi, the PSKs, the RGFs, uh, and now uh, these CIF peptides. All right. Now, what is this single receptor pathway there for? Okay, we have a ligand, we have a receptor, we can give it, we see uh, that there are, there are responses, etc. But what, what is the, the biological uh, mean and relevance uh, of the Schengen pathway? Okay, I would like to, 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 to introduce that by, by just uh, uh, talking about, about how actually we humans build complex systems. Okay, so what is becoming very, very important if you build a very complex system, like for example, a car, is that the individual components that you put in the car, you try to build them correctly in the first place. But what's what's becoming ever more important is that you check the components, okay? That you have the quality control and that these components are checked and they're actually checked under simulated conditions very often. If they are important components, they are checked under simulated stress conditions. And only if they pass these quality control mechanisms, then they are put into a car, because otherwise a car that is built of thousands of components, if there is one or two critical components that break down, then the car doesn't make more. Now, the same thing that um, applies to such a complex uh, system with different components applies also to, to simple systems, all right? So what I mean by simple system is there are many systems where actually you have one component that is repeated over and over again, but this same component, these, all these repeated components, they have to work in conjunction uh, for the whole system to work. So a silly example uh, is, for example, uh, a chain, right, where this uh, saying is coming from that a chain is only as strong as its weakest, uh, weakest link. Okay, and this one is a dangerously rusted example here. So each, so th this is an example of, of, a, of a system where you have a very simple system, you have repetition of components, but each of these components has to work. If not, the system doesn't work. And uh, coming back to plants, I think that uh, both uh, the um, uh, cuticle of, uh, of, of leaves of area tissues, uh, as much as the Kasparian strip networks are examples of uh, such a system where repeated components, which are epidermal or endodermal cells, have to do something individually in order to make a supercellular structure that is only working to its specification if none of the cells makes a mistake, okay? And that is a complicated problem if there are hundreds and hundreds of cells that have to actually do their job and not make a mistake, okay? And you could imagine that such a system would work reliably, making perfect structures in most of the cases, um, if there is a very strict quality control system, okay? And so, let us go now to, to, to the phenotypes of, of, of the Schengen pathway, okay? So it is very clear that the Schengen pathway components, they are involved in making both the embryonic cuticle and the Kasparian strip network. So to the left here, you can see um, uh, an example from, from the science paper from, from Gwyneth's lab. Um, and uh, you can see how perfect this um, cuticle is working because this, plant here in J, the Columbia, has been dipped into a dye. And you can see that there is absolutely no dye that penetrated. And there is not also some speckles of dye. There is no patches or something. This is more or less what happens all the time when you have a, a Columbia plant. You dip it in there and, uh, and the cuticle is holding and the dye is not penetrating. And this is what happens if you knock out um, the, the Schengen 3 gasho ligand um, uh, in embryogenic cuticle um, development, T, um, twisted seed one. And then you can see how this dye is penetrating and it's very traumatic, right? So this cuticle is really not formed uh, if you inactivate the Schengen pathway. The same thing, very similar actually, um, situation can be seen just with another dye, can be seen in the root. Now in the root, as you all know, the diffusion barrier is not the external barrier. So we can't um, use uh, dyes like, um, this toluene in blue dye that was used in the um, cuticle, for the cuticle. But what we are using is propidium iodide, which is a dye that just st 
stains all the cell walls. And then when you go and you make an optical cut with a confocal, you can very nicely see that um, at the level of the endodermis, there is a block of uptake of propidium iodide. And there is really, uh, it is black here inside, okay, where the uh, xylem vessels and uh, the pericycle, et cetera, they are, okay? And if you knock out the two redundant peptides that are important for Schengen-3 receptor activation um, in the root, then you can see that again, something goes terribly wrong. The barrier is not formed and everything penetrates, okay? And so what that shows very nicely is that the Schengen pathway is required um, for uh, the formation of these supercellular diffusion barriers. But what I wanna convince you of is that it is not that it is just required to make um, these um, barriers, but that actually what we have knocked out here is a feedback quality control. And because of the absence of a feedback quality control, the barriers cannot be properly formed. So, and now I wanna give you a bit of data about, about the endodermis, because that is the, the, um, the system where that is, it's established in, in, in most detail. And so here, what we have is a situation where you make actually every individual's endodermal cell makes a ring. And this ring is actually nicely positioned and it fuses with the ring from the next cell and fuses with the ring of the next cell. And that then leads to um, a supracellular um, network of Gasparian strips that block the uptake into the steel. Okay. And so this. Kasparian strips, they are a localized impregnation of the primary cell wall of endodermal cells, and they are made of lignin, okay? And so this is how it is, you know, de depicted schematically here, where you can see it is really an impregnation of the primary cell wall. This is essentially, if you would cut uh, through these rings, then you would see uh, a dot. And so here's a schematic that I hope will help you to understand the, the, the topology, the, the spatial arrangement of, of Kasparian strip in 3D, because that is very important to, to enjoy the talk uh, always. And so what you can see here is that, that if you have these rings and you cut them at the surface, you would get like a strip. And if you cut them in the middle, you would get some dots that you see like here, which are rings cut through the middle. And if you look here from the right onto the surface, then you will see, if you make a maximum projection, you will, you will see a nice um, network, okay? All right. Now we have uh, in the last uh, 10, 12 years, um, we're, we were very successful, our lab and, and, and many other labs, like for example, the lab of David Salt uh, and others, uh, to find Kasparian strip mutants, okay? And the typical Kasparian strip mutants looks a bit like this, okay? Where you can see here a surface view, very nice Kasparian strip network, okay? Very fine, very perfectly arranged. Um, and then when you knock out here, for example, something that is important for making the, the membrane domain at the Kasparian strips, the cusp one three double mutant, you can see that now you interrupt these nice Kasparian strips. But what you can see also is that there is a lot of lignin being formed. Okay, there is a lot of autofluorescence that is being, um, autofluorescent material that is established and take my word for it, it's lignin. And that you can see here in the, the what, what you see here, these two stripes to the left and to the right, those are the corners um, of the endodermal cell where there is a lot of additional lignin being deposited. Okay, and so really those are, this is a phenotype that you would see in most Kasparian strip mutants, right? So for example, an ESB1, MIP36, LOTA1, LOTA2, um, and, and others, you would see such a phenotype, okay? You break Kasparian strips, but what you are getting is actually an overproduction and delocalized production of lignin uh, in the cell corners, okay? And this, this typical, what I declare now as typical Kasparian strip uh, phenotype is not what we are seeing when we knock out the Schengen pathway. When we knock out the Schengen pathway, again, here you can see the propidium iodide, um, you can get, uh, um, this this uh, this uptake and this uptake is because the Casparian strips they are not absent they are made and they are made actually quite perfectly they are nicely positioned they are nicely established in their in their width and length and so on it, except that they are interrupted yeah? and it's really repeated interrupted as if you had photoshopped holes in there it looks very very nice but it's as if 
they started their job and then they didn't finish it. Okay. And this is how Schengen 3 looks like. This is how a CIF 1, CIF 2 double mutant look like. Uh, so many Schengen pathway mutants look like this. Okay. And so then we did a genetic experiment and that was very, very instructive. When we actually crossed a Schengen receptor mutant, Schengen 3, uh, here, for example, with a normal Casparian strip mutant. Here is an example of ESB1. And so what you can see is, again, Schengen 3 being interrupted, but having no uh, excessive lignin. Uh, ESB1 interrupted Casparian strips, but excessive lignin. You cross the two of them, and you can see that this excessive lignin yeah, is completely going away, and you get a back a phenotype that looks like Schengen 3 on its own. So in genetic terms, Schengen 3 is epistatic over ESB1. And it is quite traumatic, actually, the suppression. Now I'm showing you here the same pictures, but really um, with comparable exposure. Okay. So, and you can see that not only is there this ectopic lignin, but there is way more lignin being produced and in an ESB1 mutant. And all this excessive lignin is gone uh, when you cross it to Schengen 3. Okay. Now the question is then, uh, so th this then allows you to draw a, a, a model where you say, okay, Schengen 3 is required for this compensatory lignin, if you would think of it as compensatory lignin, okay? And the question is, how does actually Schengen 3 uh, do that, okay? Now, when we were finally now able, through this wonderful work of uh, Satoshi Fujita and, and, and many other colleagues, um, it, to tie together this, uh, this pathway into... Um, this, this, these components um, into a pathway, uh, we really learned that that uh, this receptor pathway looks very much like um, a classical um, pump receptor pathway, where you have the um, the receptor, then you have a downstream kinase um, of uh, the type RLCK7 that we call uh, Schengen 1, and then you have an NADPH oxidase that, that we discovered as, as uh, uh, Schengen 4, uh, that then produces um, um, ROS for lignin production, okay? And so when we, so it, I, I told you that that really the, the, the importance of the Schengen pathway or, or the logic of the Schengen pathway is really only understood if you consider the subcellular localization of its component. And the important thing here to consider is that Schengen 3 is actually localized just around the forming Casparian strips, but to both sides of the Casparian strip for reasons we don't understand. But the Schengen 1, uh, this downstream kinase that is very important for the transaction of the, of the signal, is localized exclusively um, to the outer, sorry, is local, um, to the outer, sorry, is localized exclusively to the outer uh, side of the Casparian strip, to the cortical uh, side of the plasma membrane, not to the steel facing side of the plasma membrane. So you have an interesting situation here where actually the receptor and its downstream kinase have a very restricted out, uh, overlap only, and it's only there where they should be active, and that is at the outer edge of the Casparian strip. And so when we finally then discovered um, the, 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 the peptides uh, for the Schengen 3 um, receptor, and we looked at their expression pattern, we saw that both CIF1 and CIF2 are expressed not in the endodermis, not constitutively, but they're expressed only uh, in steel cell layers, okay? And uh, this, is, this is shown here. They're not expressed in the endodermis, they're actually expressed in the steel. And this then allowed us to draw a model. Uh, and this model, I just wanna explain to you here um, uh, very quickly. Uh, is as follows. So Schengen 3 localizes to the left and to the right of this Casparian strip domain, as we call it. Um, Schengen 1 is this downstream kinase that localizes only to the outer side. And so the situation then, this leads to a situation where actually you can only stimulate the pathway if the peptide that is coming from the steel can cross this zone where the Casparian strip is forming. And only then will it bind to the receptor and will signal that the cusp domain should grow and that things should lignify. And this then leads to this very interesting situation where once the barrier is formed, this diffusion barrier is formed, these peptides from the steel cannot penetrate anymore across the layer, and then the, the signal will automatically stop, and this will be then a signal that the tissue layer is sealed, and, you can, and the endodermal cell can stop with further production of lignin or cusp proteins, et cetera, et cetera, that are necessary for making Casparian strips 
okay? Should there be any defect in the Casparian strip, you will have a constant penetration of this peptide outside and a constant stimulation of the Schengen pathway. And that then leads, will lead to this excessive um, overlignification in an attempt to, to, to seal the barrier uh, anyway, okay? So that's a bit our idea that the Schengen pathway, it ensures that uh, each individual cell receives the local feedback or whether, whether sealing of its barrier has been achieved. And um, in a way the, the peptides, they're a simulation of barrier functions, actually, okay? The peptides diffusion, standing in for diffusion of molecules from the rhizosphere, okay? Mineral nutrients, waters, and toxins. But while they produce the endodermis, they can already check if it's tight. They do not need to rely on a loss of water or uh, an uptake of uh, salt that is too high or something like this. A direct stress. They don't need direct stresses uh, to do so. Okay. And here are just some data to show you that um, uh, that you know this model that we are drawing it it, it actually uh, seems to work out uh, as as I'm describing it here. So first of all, you would expect that if you give this peptide not from the inside but from the outside, then something terrible happens because this endodermal cell thinks that its barrier is broken and then should overproduce lignin very uh, strongly. And this is exactly what, uh, what happens if you treat um, with external sieve, okay? And here's just the control that shows you that this terrible overlignification uh, in response to sieve is absolutely dependent uh, on the receptor, okay? And it does look, take my word for it, uh, to a certain degree, it, it looks really like a uh, um, uh, chronic simulation of the Schengen pathway uh, due to, to um, um, defects in endodermal barrier in, in mutants, okay? So we, you would also expect that we tr if we treat with SIF peptide from the inside, if we give a lot of pe SIF peptide from the inside, nothing should happen, okay? Now, this is something that is very hard for us to do, um, but I want to show you another very nice experiment that, that really um, uh, we did actually in an attempt to falsify our model, we predicted what should happen, and then we, um, we did this experiment. And this is what you can see here. We predicted from our model that the localization of Schengen 1 is very important. Schengen 1 has to be outside. And if you would put it inside, things should go wrong, okay? And Satoshi Fujita in my lab managed to do that uh, very beautifully. He essentially mutated um, the palmatulation site that allow uh, Schengen 1 to go to the membrane, and then you get a variant that actually goes only to the cytosol. And then he put back a tag that constitutively recruits um, proteins to the membrane. And then you can see that now it goes back to the membrane, but it goes back to the outer and to the inner side. And what happens then is just by this manipulation, you are getting a constitutive overlignification um, in the inner corner, mostly inner corner of um, the endodermis. Okay. And this is what you can see here. When you express a polar Schengen 1, you get this overlignification, which is fully dependent on the activity uh, of SIFs. If you take away the SIFs, then it's 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 good again, okay? And you can see that this is very nice. If you give external SIF, you get an overlignification at the outer corner. If you put uh, Schengen 1 on the inside, you get an overlignification of the inner corner. And so you have here a situation actually where you seem to have a very direct connection between the site of peptide perception and the site of lignification. And I, I, I find that uh, quite exciting because that that uh, that you we have an, an agent a peptide that can very directly induce a lignin and uh, it can do so very locally. I don't have the time to go into the details, but I just want to show you here um, that this uh, works actually out on the level of rust production. Okay, so in order to produce lignin, uh, it uh, you it is uh, accepted that you you might need rust if the lignin is produced by peroxidases. And we have data for that, that it is in the endodermis. And so what you can actually see is that uh, in the endodermis, there is always a little bit of ROS production that can be detected um, in form of uh, cerium um, perhydroxide precipitates um, at the outer edge of uh, Casparian strips. And if you treat with a SIF peptide, you can see that you get massive ROS production, but only at the outer edge of endodermal endodermal interfaces, okay? And it is really very local, but because if you if you give SIF and you look at, at the inner and the outer uh, part of endodermal cell walls, you do not see any ROS production. It's a very local ROS production, and that fits very nicely to the local lignification. Okay. So what we what I think we have here is actually a very direct pathway from lignin perception to lignin polymerization. Okay. 
So the CIF-1-2 is stimulating Schengen-1, that's stimulating um, an NADPH oxidase that produces ROS. And then uh, if it's coming from the outside, it can actually produce the ROS right at this place and produce lignin at the outer edge. If you have a problem with perception because you put Schengen-1 uh, to the inside, then you will have a constitutive stimulation of the pathway and then you will get uh, ROS production at the inside and you get lignin in the inner side. Okay. Now, very quickly, um, with the same schematics, uh, the, the, the twist now that uh, Quinneth Ingram could, uh, could develop uh, for the embryonic cuticle. Okay? In the embryonic cuticle, there were several things that were very confusing. We knew for a long time that somehow uh, um, Schengen 3 and other components uh, like Schengen 2, the TPST, uh, and, and so on, they, they were involved in um, embryonic cuticle formation. Um, but the problem was that uh, Schengen 3, GASHO 1, uh, as Quintus calls it, is expressed everywhere in the embryonic dermis. And twisted seed ligand is also produced in the epidermis, and that didn't make any sense. Uh, and then uh, they, they, they got out what's going on, and it's really um, this is an, in, an amazing way that I recommend you to read. So, what happens with twisted is when it's produced not yet active it needs um processing okay and uh Quinn knew for a long time that the endosperm produces uh, a subtilase that is called ali1 okay and this subtilase is produced in the endosperm and so with a lot of beautiful data that i can't go into uh, into they established that what is happening in this um uh, in this system is that the epidermis is producing a ligand. This ligand has to diffuse out of the epidermis, reach the endosperm or the, the place where the, the um, ALE protease is present. Here it will become processed, can diffuse back, stimulate the embryonic epidermis, telling them, hey, I could go back and forth over the border. So you haven't established a cuticle. And this will then stimulate cuticle formation. And once the cuticle is formed, they can produce now all the twisted seed they want they will not reach the processing enzymes, cannot be activated. And then in a very similar manner, you have ensured that the barrier is formed. Okay. So now we have uh, uh, three of these five peptides. Uh, and we had found that as if uh, one and two are involved in cosparin strip formation, twisted teeth is involved in embryo clinical formation. And CIF3 and CIF4, we know that they bind. We know that they are active. We can actually use it to overstimulate a lignin formation in the endodermis. They are in vivo active peptides, and it will be very interesting to see what CIF3 and CIF4 are doing and whether they're involved in co quality control in other um, diffusion barriers in the plant. Okay, so I'll stop here just acknowledging the, the amazing people that, that uh, worked on, on this pathway over the years. So Julien Alassimon did the initial screen that, that found the Schengen mutant, Daniele Ropolo found the cusp proteins that I didn't talk a lot about, but that were very, very important for us. Alexandre Pfister um, worked on uh, the Schengen 3 uh, initially, followed then up by Veronica that discovered uh, the CIF-1 and CIF-2 peptide, and then Satoshi Fujita uh, that, that was involved in many of these projects and that now has really tied uh, it all together uh, into a, a new signal detection pathway. Okay, and then I also have to acknowledge uh, Valérie Denavo, my, my lab manager, without whom, uh, not many things would work in my lab, and Damien de Belles, uh, who is an amazing electron microscopist. Um, I think uh, I here are other collaborators and uh, all the technology facilities that enable our work. Um, and this is my funding, and I thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nico. Okay, so again, I will pick a couple of, of questions from the from the audience, but but maybe I, I start with with a simple one from myself. So the CIF expression is it always there, or are there environmental factors that that uh, change the expression, and does it have an impact on the on the barrier formation? So I I don't think you need it conceptually, right? Uh, you you don't need it. So uh, you would really what would be really important, in my opinion, would be that this protein is produced all the time in sufficient amounts and that uh, when the barrier is formed then nothing can happen and you can continue to produce the, the peptide and if there is a hole 
either by some accident or by some, I don't know, fungus that tries to penetrate, I, I have no idea, then there would be uh, an alarm signal and then it can um, could go on, or let's say a letter root emerges and so on. Uh, there okay. is some, I think, um, uh, data from uh, the lab of Matsubayashi that also discovered um, the, the peptides in parallel uh, to us, uh, where I think they claim that there is some effect uh, on if you have iron excess or iron starvation or something, there is some degree uh, of, of uh, you know, modification of expression. I don't know how country relevant it really is. Mm -hmm. But I don't know of any really strong uh, environmental stimulus that strongly affects uh, civic expression. Okay, so um, maybe related to this, but, but just at a, at a higher abstraction, maybe so Pavitran Narayanan uh, is wondering about nutrient deficiency and how this um, impacts on the development of the Kasparian strip. So we, I have to say, like we haven't looked at it in great detail. We actually have looked at um, zubrization, which is the secondary formation um, of a diffusion barrier that is happening in the endodermis. We have looked a lot at, at Zubrin and have found a lot of plasticity in response to nutrient deficiencies, okay? Uh, the Kasparian strip itself, we haven't looked at it very much, but whenever we looked, uh, we didn't find that it's strong. it was strongly affected by nutrient deficiencies. There is some data, some older data that uh, from Karahara et al, um, that uh, shows that, for example, I think under salt stress, you can get uh, thicker Kasparian strips. There, there is some data, but a mm -hmm. lot of it, I, I don't really like it very much because a lot of nutrient stresses affect overall root growth. And if you're not very, very careful, uh, and uh, then you think that actually the Kasparian strip forms earlier, but it's just the overall root growth that is inhibited and then all the differentiation occurs earlier. So we found the Kasparian strip itself to be quite robust, but the secondary formation of Zubrin to be very, very uh, plastic in response to nutrient stresses. And, it, it did, and we have shown and others uh, are showing that this has a lot of impact uh, on nutrient uptake actually, the degree of zubrization. So for me, the Kasparian strip is kind of like a basal thing that always needs to be there, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, there are a couple of questions that, that relate, um, let's say, to the downstream components of the Schengen. So I, I maybe combine here the question of Sascha Weidmann and, and Jan Hiyatko as, as two examples. So Sascha is wondering about the, the direct targets of the Schengen 1 kinase. Um, and Jan Hiyatko wonders about whether, um, whether the, the Schengen pathway is, is also linked to cortical microtubules. Okay. So... First question, um, the, whether the direct targets of the Schengen-1 uh, receptor. So the Schengen-1 is not the receptor, right? It's the receptor like cytoplasmic kinase, which would be like a homologue to big one or for people that work on the PRRs, the people, uh, the people like um, kinases. It's a people like kinase. Um, and so what we know is only one direct substrate and that is the N-terminus of RBOHF. So uh, we can show that it can directly in vitro phosphorylate um, RBHF, and together with your Kutler, we could show in an in vivo reconstitution assay um, in, um, uh, in mammalian cell cultures, we could show that um, it can directly activate uh, uh, RBHF in the system. So this is a direct target, and that's uh, very nice because like big one is like a downstream kinase of FLS2, uh, can directly activate uh, RBOHD, so that would make a lot of sense. I would guess that uh, one of the direct targets of, of Schengen-1 uh, are MAP KKKs, okay? Uh, because we could show that stimulating um, Schengen-3 with CIF peptides leads to activation of uh, MAP kinases, and we have some uh, preliminary unpublished data uh, from Jan Ma in my lab uh, that uh, MAP kinases are indeed uh, important for uh, the Schengen-3 pathway signal transduction, okay? So the second question uh, was about, uh, can you tell me again? Cortical Jürgen? microtubules. As, the as cortical another microtubules, yes. Other yes. aspects. So I, we don't know, we haven't looked at it. That would be relatively easy to actually throw uh, now, throw a peptide on, um, on the endodermis and look if the microtubules uh, change. Now, Maybe Jan is asking that because there are there is wonderful work uh, for um, xylem uh, in xylem vessels where actually the localization of the lignin uh, is dependent uh, a lot on the dynamics of the microtubules. 
but this is really indirect uh, in so far as the, um, the, the cortical microtubules determine where secondary cell wall is put down uh, and then where the secondary cell wall is, lignification will occur um, later. So we have looked whether the localization of lignin, the Casparian strips are dependent on microtubules very early on. And we have really looked, uh, <laughs> we wanted to see something and we didn't, we, we didn't find any indication um, that there is a microtubule cytoskeleton uh, involved. And so this is why we haven't looked whether SIF affect uh, microtubule mm -hmm. dynamics or something like this, but that would be relatively easy to do now. Mm -hmm. So your previous surf buddy, Greg Wert, is, is wondering yes. um, whether you see overproduction of lignin when the lateral roots break through the, the endodermis due to the SIF diffusion. <laughs> So, yes, maybe. So, what happens if uh, a lateral root is emerging is that uh, what we can see is not that the lignin disappears, right? That would be something very hard uh, for, a, for, a, for a plant to do. But what we see is that the Casparian strip fragments in, in some really strange, uh, strange ways, okay? And then the lateral root emerges. Now, we would have thought at that point uh, that it's easy to see that when a lateral root emerges, if you get the, it just right, uh, that PI will penetrate very strongly into, um, the, into the steel. We do see that sometimes, but it's actually surprisingly limited. And the reason for this is, I think it's because the plant organizes it so well. So the, it, the, they squeeze away the, the, the endodermis, then they emerge, and then they very quickly, the endodermal cells that touch um, the, the lateral root um, will form a lot of lignin and a lot of zubrin, okay? And this will seal, like a, like a scar, it will seal now the, um, and it connects then to the, to the Casparian strip network of the side root, okay? And that will seal it very, very quickly. So the, it's, it's very hard to see actually that there is um, penetration from dye to the inside. And so I would guess also that a peptide that penetrates to the outside would be very limited. And I have to say, we haven't strictly looked into how quickly, for example, this lignification and zuberization is occurring in a Schengen 3 mutant, right? Uh, so we haven't done that, but it would be very hard for us to do because the Schengen 3 mutant, it, there, there is constant penetration anyway, right? So, but, but we, we could look at it, um, whether there is less lignin and less zubrin being formed in such a mutant, that would actually be something interesting to look at. We haven't mm -hmm. done that. Yeah. Um, Tom Bigman is, is wondering about the embryo um, as it needs the endosperm, right? So it needs uh, to be supplied from the endosperm. Yes. Sperm. So he wonders about the timing um and how this is, is scheduled not to compromise the exchange of nutrients yes um that's a very good question uh because indeed what happens eventually is that the entire embryo uh, is covered uh, in a cuticle and even as you as you might have seen there is like data that shows that even the the root cap uh, uh, is mm -hmm. developing a cuticle that is very quickly shed uh, after germination and so indeed the, the embryo at one point is covered uh, in a cuticle and then it would be um, difficult to, 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 to see that. But I think it's happening, it's happening quite late. So the, the, I think the pictures that show that there is, for example, an interrupted cuticle um, in the embryo, this is at a hard to torpedo stage. Um, you would have to look into, into um, the, the Dollar Al paper of, uh, of Quinnet. Uh, but I think it's 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 relatively late, right? That this embryo, that the cuticle starts to form, um, and it it it's it's it, it's quite complicated. So it could be that there is a cuticle that forms that is that is that is quite perfect, right? Because maybe it it actually inhibits already now uh, peptide diffusion, which is quite a quite a big uh, molecule, and it's it's very nicely and smoothly formed, so that the peptide can't diffuse. But it's 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 a quite a thin cuticle. I think uh, uh, during a, a long time during embryogenesis, and then uh, it becomes it becomes stronger again. But mm -hmm. I, I would I don't want to want to bullshit now. But, um, Tom should uh, should get in contact with Quidditch to to give uh, the, the exact details about that. But yeah. it is true. But it forms relatively late. Okay, last question, and and I um, give it to your previous PhD student, so Julian Alassimone. And he's wondering if yes. there's any new insight um, on the Schengen-1 polarity. 
on the Schengen one power, oh, the, the mechanism of Schengen one polarity. Uh, yes. Not really, not really. Uh, we, we had some, uh, Julien was the, the guy that did, uh, that did what, what is still um, the, the things uh, that, that, that I would say now. So we, uh, we know that uh, we can actually get the polarity uh, independent of the, the activity of the kinase. Uh, so then there is less going to the plasma membrane, but the polarity is kept. We can take the end and C terminus uh, and uh, exchange actually with a, with an FP and it will still um, go to the, um, to, to the membrane again inefficiently, but it will still be, um, it will still be polar. So it, 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 it is somewhere in the N and, uh, uh, N and T terminus. And, and we should really go back onto, onto that if I could convince somebody to to work on that, like what is it? So what I would like to do first is to compare it, for example, in the endodermis with another kinase, for example, big one, uh, and just put big one there and establish, I would hope that big one uh, is not uh, polar. And then if you have like another kinase that is very well investigated, uh, maybe do domain swaps in order to really figure mm -hmm. out what it is uh, that determines the polarity. But we, we still haven't advanced uh, for a number of years now on this, on this topic. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you, you could convince somebody to look into this. So, uh, Nico, <laughs> thank you for the, the great talk and, and also for the nice discussion. There are many more thank questions. Um, and, and again, so um, if, if somebody would like to continue this discussion, uh, put the hashtag at Twitter, Plante Presents, and uh, add it at Nico's Twitter handle, at Nico Geltner, um, and then the discussion can go on. And, and Nico will also get the full list of, of questions uh, after the talk. So perfect. Thank I'll you go both of you. Yes. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you both of you. So Sarah and um, and Nico and um, especially also Sarah, as you know, with with this um, technical issues that that he, she um, immediately jumped in. So I think we had two very nice um, uh, talks, and um, I appreciate that you guys took your time and uh, um, and lectured us today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for organizing this. <laughs>